1935, the specification for the Panzer that was to become the backbone of the tank arm in the first half of the Second World War was issued by the German Army. The quest for the optimum design for this 15-ton Panzer led to a number of trials vehicles, such as the Panzer III Model A produced in 1937, and followed thereafter by Models B and C with similar suspension types, just 15 of the former and 30 of the latter being built. The final trials machine was produced in 1938 by Daimler-Benz. Rejected as a battle tank, a number were converted into command panzers. The Model E proved a success and was ordered into production in December of 1938, a few being ready to take part in the military parade celebrating Hitler's birthday in April 1939, in which Panzer IIs and IVs predominate. It was the new torsion bar suspension system fitted to the Model E that led to its adoption by the Army. The Panzer III now acquired the basic design configuration to characterise the type until removed from production in 1943. Standard armament was a 37mm L45 gun. The new suspension also permitted an increase in armour protection with a corresponding weight rise to 19.5 tonnes. Compared to the Panzer IV, the Panzer III was a latecomer on the scene. A few served in the occupation of Czechoslovakia, but only 98 Panzer III's were on strength when Poland was invaded on the 1st of September 1939. Nearly all of those employed were early development vehicles such as this Model B. With five companies now involved in producing the Model F, which came online in October 1939, availability of the Panzer III rose sharply, some 435 being produced by July 1940. This allowed anti-tank gunners in training exercises such as this, filmed during the very cold winter of 39-40, to acquaint themselves with the machine in the period prior to the Western Campaign. Introduction of the Model G in April 1940 saw the production program of the Mark III expand even further. Only with the introduction of the 50mm L42 gun in the last 100 Fs and the 51st example of the G was the simmering controversy over Mark III armament partially resolved. In his capacity as Chief of Mobile Troops, Heinz Guderian had insisted this weapon be fitted from the outset of the production of the type, but had been overruled by the Army Ordnance Department, who insisted that the Panzer III mount a variant of the same 37mm gun used by the troops in this footage. On the early morning of the 10th of May 1940, the Wehrmacht invaded France and the Low Countries. The campaign began with airstrikes by the Luftwaffe on Allied airfields. Although not fatally weakened, the damage the Allies suffered in these raids gave the Luftwaffe the vital local air superiority it needed to provide an aerial umbrella for the army, under which it could operate untroubled by enemy air attacks. This was to prove vital to the success of the campaign. Then came paratroopers dropping on Belgium and Holland, and followed shortly thereafter by the ground invasion of both countries by Army Group B, precipitating, as the Germans had intended, the advance of the Allied armies into Belgium. To the south and through the forest of the Ardennes, in country deemed by the French to be unsuitable to armour, Army Group A began its advance towards the River Meuse. The fist of this German formation and the true centre of gravity of German offensive power in the campaign were the two Panzer Corps under the command of von Kleist. Deployed within the total of 10 Panzer divisions in the two army groups were a total of 2,574 tanks, of which 348 were Panzer III's, a number amounting to just one-seventh of the total committed, and all of which carried the 37mm gun. Nevertheless, it's clear that the Mark III's significance in the campaign was out of all proportion to the numbers employed. Once across the Meuse, the Panzer III's were to be found at the point of the Panzer Division's drive for the Channel. By May 20th, this had cut off the Allied forces in Belgium from France proper. Their destruction had been achieved by June the 5th. The subsequent German invasion of the rest of France brought about a rapid military collapse and French capitulation by the 22nd of June. As German victory in France had turned more on the concentrated employment of armoured divisions as instruments of paralysis, using their speed and momentum to demoralise the enemy, rather than standing to and fighting it out, the technical limitations of many of the German tank types had been of little immediate consequence. 
Nevertheless, the occasional tank-to-tank -tank clash with heavily armoured French and British machines had revealed concerns that needed to be addressed. Post-battle analysis identified that the primary weakness of the Mark III was the woefully inadequate performance of its 37mm gun. German anti-tank gunners, having viewed with frustration and trepidation the way the armour-piercing shells of their own 37mm anti-tank guns bounced off the armour of the French Char 1B and British Matilda IIs, had disparagingly labelled it the army's door knocker. Hitler himself now demanded that the Panzer III be rearmed to carry the high-velocity, long-barreled 50mm L60 cannon. As if to prove that the Führer's word was not always law, the Army Ordnance Office simply ignored the order, taking the view that industry had only just tooled up to produce and fit the short-barreled 50mm gun in the Panzer III, and that employment of the long-barreled 50mm cannon for the new Pac-38 anti-tank was a higher priority. Subsequently, contracts for the Panzer III Model H, awarded in October to the companies of Mann, Alkit, Henschel, Mayag, Wegmann and MNH, specified the main armament as the short-barreled 50mm cannon. Guderian was later to recall that it was only in February 1941 that Hitler learnt, to his profound annoyance, that his instructions had not been carried out. It's not possible to quantify the consequences of this disobedience, although Major General F. W. Melantan, author of the seminal work entitled Panzer Battles, was in no doubt that it went far to lose Germany the war. When appointed by Hitler to command the Africa Corps in March 1941, Rommel saw in the wide and open spaces of North Africa the perfect laboratory to explore the true potential of mobile warfare. While he understood this to be a combined arms enterprise, clearly the tank lay at its heart. In practice, it was the Panzer III that was to become the true war horse of the Africa Corps in all of its battles. The German invasion of the Balkans in early April 1941, although limited in extent, employed a high proportion of mobile forces. Five panzer divisions and two motorised infantry divisions found themselves engaged in an intense, albeit short, conflict just a few weeks before they were due to embark on their most demanding campaign. While a large number of the earlier models of Panzer III's employed had already been up-armoured and up-gunned with the short-barrelled 50mm cannon, a significant number of those seen in newsreel footage and photographs taken during the campaign in Yugoslavia and Greece were still equipped with the ineffectual 37mm gun. The German invasion of the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941, though planned as a rapid campaign in the best Blitzkrieg tradition, was to become the bloodiest and most brutal conflict in history. While the Germans had committed immense resources to the invasion and were replete in the conviction that the Red Army could be dispatched as efficiently as the French Army just a year before, the former ally they now assailed was, in reality, an enigma. German estimates of Soviet actual and potential military power were both remarkably vague and in error. What there was derived more from wishful thinking than hard-headed analysis of intelligence. Above all, German perceptions of the Red Army were coloured by the assumption that the Soviet officer corps had yet to recover from the huge purge of its ranks by Stalin in the Great Terror of the 1930s. It would thus be unable to withstand the most formidable war machine the world had yet seen. 
The Germans saw in its lamentable performance in the Winter War against Finland in 1939-40 the very evidence to sustain the former conviction. Thus could Hitler state with confidence, we have only to kick in the front door and the whole rotten structure will come tumbling down. The primary instrument to effect the destruction of the Red Army in European Russia, before it had time to retreat into the depths of the country, was the Panzerwaffe. It appeared on the face of it that in the year since the fall of France, the tank arm had nearly doubled in size, so as to take account of the far greater demands that this campaign must surely impose upon it. Such a perception was illusory, for all that Hitler had done was simply to order the halving of existing divisions to create new ones. 17 panzer divisions, distributed among the four panzer group of army groups north, centre and south, deployed some 3,332 tanks for the campaign, the bulk of which were still the same obsolescent light tanks with which Germany had gone to war in 1939. The Panzer III was now the single most numerous type in service with the Ostheer, and in the opening months of the campaign performed admirably. As the bulk of Soviet armour was decidedly obsolescent, the 50mm L-42 cannon, equipping the majority of those Mark III's engaged, was more than adequate. But then came the encounter with a new generation of Soviet armour of which the Germans knew absolutely nothing. The KV-1 and KV-2 weighed in at 43 and 52 tonnes respectively, with immensely thick armour of up to 75 millimetres on the turret of the former. The armour-piercing shot of the Panzer III could not penetrate the armour of the KV-1, even at close range. The T-34 was even more of a concern. Low, fast and well armed, on wide tracks that permitted movement over rough ground and with thick angled armour that was difficult to penetrate. Most encountered in the early months of the campaign were dispatched, albeit with some difficulty, by point-blank fire, special charges or the 88mm flat gun. There were simply too few of them to make a difference. In spite of the first reports of these new Soviet tanks, the technical challenge they represented was not initially apparent in Germany, even if it was more obvious to the troops at the front. This much can be ascertained by the decision of the Wehrmacht Tank Committee on July the 17th, 1941, to order construction of 7,992 Mark III's to equip the 36 Panzer divisions that the army now required for its future needs. With the elimination of the Soviet forces encircled in the battles of the frontiers, the fall of Minsk on June the 28th, the Panzergruppers under Guderian and Haute surged forward once more to capture Smolensk. Although the Soviets put up very heavy resistance, the jaws of the two Panzergruppers closed around the city on the 16th of July. But that resistance resulted in the encircled forces fighting on until the 27th, when 100,000 more Russians passed into captivity. Unlike in previous campaigns, the Germans discovered that the Soviets did not oblige them by laying down their arms when all, on the basis of rational analysis, was clearly lost. They fought on, often to the last man. German losses were also climbing significantly, and even the Panzer divisions were being thinned out by combat attrition and breakdowns. Nevertheless, both Guderian and Haut were well placed to strike out for Moscow, which lay less than 200 miles away. At the beginning of August, Hitler flew to Russia to discuss strategy with his generals, flying by way of Minsk to take a view of the city. His plane then flew on to Borisov. On his arrival, he was given a rapturous reception by the troops and was officially greeted by Field Marshal von Bock, commander of Army Group Center. For four weeks, the Panzers had been held pending the order to advance on Moscow, and it seemed the Fuhrer might no longer regard Moscow as the priority objective. Guderian reported to Hitler that he was ready to resume the advance on Moscow between the 15th and 20th of August, and assured Hitler the Soviet capital would fall. Hitler listened but did not commit himself. It was clear that he remained unconvinced by their arguments. Only on the 23rd of August did Guderian learn that Hitler had ruled against Moscow and ordered his Panzergruppe south to assist in the destruction of the Soviet army around Kiev. 
For the Soviet government and the Red Army, the sudden 90-degree turn by Guderian's Panzergruppe took them completely by surprise. So sure were they that the Germans would lunge for Moscow. But once seen, his intention could not be mistaken. With the tanks of Kleitz Panzergruppe pushing forward to the south of Kiev, it could only mean that their intended target was the destruction of the Soviet army group under the command of Marshal Sermon Budyeni. As Guderian's forces drove south through deep forests and towards the river Desna, they were concerned that having gauged the likely German intention, Budyeni would most certainly want to start withdrawing his troops from the Kiev area and across the river Dnieper before the jaws of the German armoured groups could snap shut. Stalin, however, came to the aid of the Germans, for he categorically refused to permit Budyeni to withdraw. Unsere Panzerkampfwagen haben die fliehenden Feindkolonnen erreicht. Tod und Verderben bricht über die Sowjets herein. By the 10th of September, Kleist Panzerkorps had reached the city of Kremenchuk on the western bank of the river Dnieper, directly to the south of Guderian's panzer columns driving down from Smolensk. 16th Panzer Division now drove north and, on the 13th, stormed the town of Lubny, while 3rd Panzer Division lay just 60 miles away to the north and was pushing south against fierce opposition. In spite of Stalin's injunction to hold firm, Soviet units, aware of the closing gap, streamed desperately towards it to make good their escape. The speed of both the northern and southern jaws was being severely affected by the weather as the rains had turned the roads into glutinous mud. Contact between the 1st and 2nd Panzergruppers was finally established at 18.20 hours on the 14th of September 1941. In the subsequent reduction of the Kiev pocket, an army of over 1 million had been reduced to dead, dying and 665,000 prisoners. On all sides, the Deutschen Verbände in the Kessel. Vor. Am 27. September war die gigantische Schlacht beendet. Just over a month later, a further 663,000 prisoners wound their way westward under guard as the opening battle of Operation Typhoon, the last operation to capture Moscow before the onset of winter, came to an end. In the twin encirclement battle of Vyazma and Bryansk, the panzer divisions of the 3rd, 4th and 2nd panzer groupers had between them shattered the Soviet defences in front of Moscow, leaving the approaches to the Soviet capital stripped of defences. Surely nothing could stop the Germans taking the city.
With the Panzers to the fore, the drive resumed. Third Panzergrupper had the luxury of using the Moscow Highway, one of the very few tarmac roads in the whole of Russia. But the other Panzer divisions had to make do with traversing fields and the sandy tracks on the maps that passed for roads. One depressing augury came on the 11th of October when T-34s for the first time attacked German tanks en masse and gained the better of them. Guderian said that this was the first time that the vast superiority of the T-34 had become apparent. Then came the rains and with it the mud that reduced everything to a crawl and then a halt. Soviet resistance now began to stiffen. The Germans decided to resume their advance on the 15th of November so as to give time for the frost to take effect and freeze the ground. In all, three weeks were lost to the foul weather, three vital weeks that, in all probability, led to the failure of Operation Typhoon. Nur die besten Soldaten der Welt werden auch mit diesen ungeheuren Schwierigkeiten fertig. When the advance resumed as planned, the ground was hard and already covered by a light sprinkling of snow. The Panzers seemed to have regained their freedom of movement. Holt's Panzergrupper seemed to be on the verge of breaking through. By the 28th of November, they had reached the Moscow Volga Canal. But although forward movement was being maintained, it was becoming very clear that the army was coming to the end of its tether, and the plunging temperatures began to impact on man and machine alike. Siberian troops had already made their first appearance. Frostbite cases increased dramatically and the weather declined markedly. On the 1st of December, Bock stated that he believed forward progress no longer possible. By the 5th, the German advance had ground to a halt and in some places they had even begun to withdraw. On that same day, the Red Army employing reserve armies went over to the counter-offensive before Moscow. At the beginning of January 1942, 50 Panzer III's arrived at Naples from Germany for shipment to a very tank-hungry Rommel in North Africa. All were examples of the Model J, which had entered production in March 1941. Although retaining the short 50mm gun, protection had been improved with the superstructure, hull and gun mantlet armour being increased to a basic 50mm. It had the longest production run of any of the Mark III subtypes being manufactured until July 1942, by which time 1,549 had been produced. Although a number of those went to equip 2nd and 5th Panzer Divisions, the bulk of the production run were employed as replacements for losses in Russia and North Africa, as many as 1,400 Panzer III's being destroyed in the fighting in 1941. The convoy of nine merchant ships, escorted by no fewer than four Italian battleships, and under a sky controlled by Luftwaffe units operating out of Sicily, arrived intact in Tripoli on the 5th. Offloading of the Mark III's and Italian Army M1340's provided Rommel with a force sufficiently strong to enable him to successfully attack the 8th Army. Determining that the British were now experiencing severe supply problems and that they were also pulling out forces, particularly air power, to send to the Far East to fight the Japanese, he launched his attack on the 21st of January. Although he was inferior in tanks, just 150 to the enemy's 360, he determined that the enemy would crumple in the face of his unexpected attack. 
By the 26th, with the 8th Army in full retreat, Rommel credited the Africa Corps with having captured and destroyed 299 enemy tanks and other AFVs, 147 guns and 935 prisoners, set against German losses of just three panzers destroyed and 14 officers and men killed. In seizing Benghazi, Rommel was able to acquire an invaluable number of captured trucks, which were immediately incorporated into the Africa Corps. The follow-up of the retreating British forces pushed them back as far as Gazala, 30 miles to the west of Tobruk, by the 4th of February, where both sides would stay put throughout the spring, rebuilding their strength for the next round. In the meantime, Rommel, never coy when it came to publicity, was always more than happy to oblige the ever-present cameraman by examining captured enemy equipment and striking up the appropriate pose. All grist to the mill for Goebbels' propaganda department and the German newsreels. This sequence gives a graphic impression of the conditions in which both German and Soviet troops fought during the winter of 41-42, the worst to hit Russia in 50 years. Actions of the sort seen here, with infantry supported by armour, fighting to retake or capture a village or position in the middle of a bleak and forbidding snowscape, was a common occurrence. Because of its narrow track, the Panzer III did not find movement through deep snow to be that easy. This is best seen when comparing this footage with that of the T-34 moving at speed across snow seen earlier. In such conditions, the Mark III was at a significant disadvantage. It was in order to address this problem that Ostkedden, or the so-called Eastern Tracks, were developed. These were track extensions for use in snow that widened the track of the Panzer III, lowering its ground pressure and giving it a better ride. The transfer of armour from one threatened sector to another across large distances of a Russian winter, when deep snow covered the land, could not be made by tanks without recourse to trains. The flatbeds provided by Deutsche Reichsbahn had been built to the continental loading width for tunnels of 10 feet 4 inches. The widths of the Panzer III and its stablemate, the Mark IV, were designed to take account of this constraint. The onset of the thaw at winter's end in Russia is known to the native as Ratsputitsa and reduces all movement to a virtual halt. The Russians have long realized that General Mud is a commander who cannot be argued with and never won over. Even war must take a back seat when he stalks the land. In the period before the soil dries out enough to permit a resumption of combat operations, the opportunity is taken to give the tanks and other vehicles a long needed maintenance after the predations of the winter. Eine Panzerabteilung bereit zu neuem Einsatz. An orders group proceeds a training exercise in a Panzer battalion behind the front line in Russia. Even though on hand for combat operations, such exercises were essential to induct replacement crews into the specialized aspects of Panzer operations and hone the skills necessary to allow the unit to function effectively. Although the bulk of this battalion comprises Panzer 3s, a number of Panzer 4s are present in their intended role to offer fire support with their 75mm guns. Über völlig aufgeweichte Straßen und Felder rollen die Panzerkampfwagen nach vorn. Kameradschaftliche Hilfe, Gebirgsjäger werden im Schlepp mitgenommen. On May the 17th, 1942, the Germans launched their counterblow against the Soviet forces, who one week earlier had launched a massive offensive under the command of Marshal Timoshenko, designed to capture Kharkov and encircle Sixth Army. Though the Soviet assault was initially successful, the Germans had contained the offensive by the 15th and 16th and were now about to deliver their riposte. After six days of heavy fighting, they had cut off the Soviet salient and were now proceeding to destroy the Soviet forces therein. As they proceeded to reduce the pocket, Soviet troops surrendered and a mass of abandoned equipment fell into their hands.
Stukas from the 4th Air Group began their own assault on the entrapped Soviet units. The Germans now had to contend with ferocious attempts at breakout from the pocket as well as containing powerful Soviet pressure from an assault force attacking it, trying to break in across the river Donets to the east. The fighting that took place was described by some as the most savage of the war. German armour was heavily engaged against Soviet tanks as well as supporting infantry to defeat massed Soviet infantry assaults. When finally the resistance of the Soviets was broken after three days, the booty and tally of prisoners was immense. Scattered across the landscape were no less than 1,250 destroyed and abandoned tanks and 2,026 guns of all calibers. 239,000 Red Army soldiers now marched into captivity, most never to return. It was a victory redolent of the previous summer's great triumphs, and it seemed the fitting overture for the main German summer offensive, which Hitler believed would finally give to him the victory over the Soviet Union, which had eluded him the previous year. Case Blue, Hitler's codename for his great summer offensive in southern Russia, opened in the closing days of June. By the end of the second week of July, German forces under the command of Army Group A were approaching the important city of Rostov-on-Don. The primary task of this army group was to advance southwards toward the Caucasus in order to seize the oil fields there, then the vital crossing point over the River Don at Rostov. The bulk of the footage seen hereafter is concerned with this operation and contains some of the finest combat films shot during the war, not least for its extensive coverage of the Panzer III in action. While the Panzer III still predominated as the main tank type, 600 of the Mark J and L models, mounting the more formidable long-barreled 50mm L60 gun, were on hand for the summer campaign. It will be recalled that it was this gun that Hitler had demanded to be fitted to the Mark III following the French campaign. It was only in April 1941, when, at a review of military equipment to celebrate his birthday, did he see that the Panzer III still mounted the short 50mm L42 cannon. He then demanded that on this occasion his order be obeyed, but the Panzer III with the L60 did not leave the production line for another eight months, first appearing in December 1941. The advantage of the longer barrel on the 50mm gun was the higher muzzle velocity it imparted to its anti-tank rounds, thus allowing it to penetrate a greater thickness of armour plate. However, while the L60 was used to great effect in the Western Desert, where the British called it the Mark III Special, it was not as effective when employed against the Soviet heavies. By the 20th of July, a number of mobile units were converging on Rostov from different directions. Three Panzer Corps under the command of General von Mackensen and comprising the 14th and 22nd Panzer Divisions was approaching the city from the north, while von Schweppenberg's Panzer Corps was attempting to seize the city in the hope of securing control of the Great Bridge over the river before the Soviets could blow it up. Approaching from the west, the panzers of SS Viking and 13th Panzer had first to traverse the tank ditch that bisected their approach to the city. This was filled in with the aid of many entrenching tools and stamping feet. 
Of note are these Panzer threes, which are Model Ls, first introduced in June 1942. The most noticeable change being the addition of provision for spaced armour on the gun mantlet. Heavy fighting was encountered on the steppe approaches to the city. Stukas were called in to bomb Soviet entrenchments and defences. With the outer defence zones penetrated, 13th Panzer attacked towards the centre of the city with its Mark III's, motorcyclists and riflemen. Street fighting against the Soviets was extremely hazardous as they were past masters in the art. The German soldiers using the half-tracks for cover are acutely aware of just how good Soviet snipers were. Sowjets haben jede Straße festungsartig ausgebaut. Sie wissen, dass der Verlust von Rostov für den weiteren Kampfverlauf von entscheidender Bedeutung ist und wehren sich mit verbissener Wut. The troops of SS Viking now found themselves pinned down in very heavy street fighting. Jede Hand breit Boden wird heiß umkämpft. Of interest is the use by troops of Viking of the 50mm Pac-38 mounted on a one-ton half-track. The fighting becomes ever more fierce as the troops reach the centre of the city, where the Soviets have spent much time and effort fortifying all the buildings over the months since the Germans first took the city and were ejected in November 1941. Fighting in Rostov continued for several days with a slow and costly process of clearing each house and street one at a time. A process inhibited not just by the fanatical resistance of Red Army soldiers and elite NKVD troops, but by the incredible defences. Barricades of torn up paving slabs, bricked up street entrances, steel girders planted in the ground, buried mines and so forth. No quarter was given by either side. Even the German wounded had to be guarded as many were killed as they awaited evacuation. Romanian soldiers were also involved in the fighting and also took heavy casualties in the process. It 
it was the 25th of July before Rostov was completely in German hands. Abandoned and destroyed Soviet equipment littered the streets in vast quantities. Zil lorries, artillery tractors, heavy guns and anti-aircraft weapons. And now the artillery made its way through the city to the bridge, finally secured on the 25th by a coup mounted by the Brandenburg Regiment, the German army's own commandos. column of captured Soviet prisoners snaked their way westward to an uncertain future. Amidst the great heat and dust, there could have been very few that did not view their future with trepidation. For the German army, the signposts now pointed south towards the Caucasus and the oil fields. A short rest and the panzers were off again. Temperatures as high as 40 degrees centigrade, the divisions of Army Group A moved off and out over the bridges on the Don, south towards the great mountain range that lay some 300 miles away across the bone dry and furnace like steppe. Seen from the air, German transport columns follow in the wake of the advancing panzers, carrying all the supplies needed to allow a mobile army to fight. Oil, gasoline, water, ammunition, food, clothing, the very sinews of modern war. At this stage of the campaign, optimism still reigned that the end of the war was at last in sight. As originally tasked in Case Blue, the role of Hope's 4th Panzer Army was clear. He was to employ his 800 Panzers to destroy Soviet forces, first in the Kursk area and then destroy the army group of Marshal Timoshenko along the line of the River Don. He was then to make for Stalingrad, with 6th Army marching down the line of the river in his wake. But on July the 5th, Hitler ordered the 4th Panzer Army south to assist von Kleist and 1st Panzer Army take Rostov and the lower Don crossings. This help was not needed, and by the 25th of July there were 20 divisions standing to in a 50-mile radius of Rostov. Had Hote still been following the original plan, Stalingrad would have probably have fallen to him quite quickly. Although 4th Panzer Army had divisions across the river by the 21st, 22nd of July, Hitler now detached 24th Panzer Corps and sent them northeast to assist 6th Army, which was facing heavy resistance as the Soviets determined to make a stand in the city. German Panzer divisions attached to 6th Army now found themselves sucked into street fighting, as is seen with these Panzer 3Js of 24th Panzer. Through the next three months, until the Soviet counteroffensive in November, the Panzers were slowly ground down in conditions totally unsuitable for their proper employment. Reduced in the main to supporting infantry assaults in restricted conditions, they became victims of intrepid Soviet soldiers armed with Molotov cocktails and anti-tank rifles. With their mobility severely curtailed, and being so heavily involved in fighting in the ruins of the city, the panzer divisions in Stalingrad were thus unable to respond effectively when the Russians encircled 6th Army. When von Paulus surrendered at the end of January 1943, the city was a Panzer III graveyard.
Panzer III and Panzer IV Specials were the key weapons in Rommel's plan to unhinge the British defensive positions by a thrust through the Ragil Depression into the flank of the Alum Halfa Ridge on the 31st of August 1942. The Africa Corps was at the height of its success. The assault failed and with it the last chance for Rommel to take Egypt. Following the Allied invasion of North Africa in early November 1942, Hitler ordered German forces to move quickly and occupy Vichy France on November the 10th. The footage of the German forces involved allows the first glimpse of the last model of the Panzer III to be produced in any numbers. 663 of the Model M were manufactured between June 1942 and August 1943. The type is easily recognisable as carrying the short 75mm low-velocity calibre weapon employed in all models of the Panzer IV up to the F1. With this mark, the Panzer III comes full circle. Originally designed as a battle tank with the Panzer IV to support it, it has now become a support tank itself, both to the later model Panzer IVs and the Tiger tank. By this time, the days of the Panzer III as a battle tank were numbered. Although the Army deemed it to be a better machine than the Mark IV, its smaller size condemned it to obsolescence, being unable to be further upgunned. This would seem to be a case of the understudy stepping forward to become the lead player. The other Panzer III's advancing with the Model M's are L-types. German troops and their tanks were to remain in Vichy France as occupation forces until they were destroyed or forced to retreat by the Allied landings in southern France in August 1944. At the same time as occupying Vichy France, Hitler ordered 10th Panzer and the Hermann Göring Panzer Division into Tunisia as the first stage in a major build-up to retain an Axis bridgehead in Africa. First combat between the Germans and the Allies in Tunisia occurred on the 17th of November, but only in the spring did the real fighting begin. By then, the remnants of the Africa Corps had arrived in southern Tunisia. These long-barreled 50mm L60 Mark III's represent the last of the medium tank models to come off the production line. Just 250 Model M's were produced between October 42 and February 43 by the four companies involved in Panzer III manufacture. Initially 1,000 of this model had been ordered, but in July 43 this was cut back, reflecting the decision to run down Mark III production, apart from the Model N, and allocate the chassis to the manufacture of assault guns. 100 of this model were also converted into flamethrowing tanks. Those seen here are advancing to fight a British advance at Taborba in November 1942, in one of the initial Allied attempts to advance on Tunis. As the fight for control of the air was still in the balance, German infantry appear to be unconcerned about taking a ride on these Mark III's. Nor do the Panzers carry any foliage suggesting that they also do not fear Allied aircraft at this stage. British Crusader Mark III's carrying six-pounder guns lie forlorn and desolate after having been destroyed by German Mark III's. While the British tank was upgunned, its armour protection was inadequate to protect it from the fire of a Mark III Special. At 6am on the morning of the 14th of February 1943, the Germans launched Operation Spring Breeze by hurling 140 panzers against Allied forces at Sidi side with strong Luftwaffe support. The bulk of the German armour comprised Mark III's and Mark IV's. The Germans achieved complete surprise, resulting in the American forces falling back on Spetler, leaving a battlefield covered with the wrecks of 44 Sherman and M3 Lee tanks and 59 half-tracks. 
On the following day, an American counterattack headed for the German positions in parade ground fashion, allowing the Germans to let them into range before they demolished them. On this occasion, they left behind a further 54 tanks, 57 half-tracks and 29 guns. In the absence of virtually any evidence on German newsreels to suggest that the German army ever lost tanks in battle, these still images of destroyed Panzer III's will serve to show that it did occur. All were taken in Tunisia in different battles near Medej El Bab, Tala and the Marath Line. Many fell victim to British 6-pounder and 17-pounder anti-tank guns. By early February 1943, the Red Army had pushed the Germans back to the start line of their 1942 summer campaign. Stalin was above all concerned to bring about the destruction of Army Group South before the end of winter. He therefore ordered the forces of the South West Front to advance to the River Dnieper. In the wake of the surrender of Stalingrad and the German retreat in the South, Stalin had convinced himself that what he desired was coming to pass. So when a concentration of German armour was detected, it was assumed that it was but the prelude to a further withdrawal. What was in reality occurring under the guiding hand of Field Marshal von Manstein were the preparations for a counter-offensive against the westward driving and rapidly exhausting Soviet forces. The heart of his armoured fist was the SS Panzer Corps recalled from France, where the three Waffen SS Panzergrenadier divisions had been rebuilt and re-equipped they now constituted one of the most powerful mobile elements in the German order of battle in the East. Manstein unleashed his forces on the 19th of February and by the 22nd had destroyed the larger part of the 1st Guards Army and the Popov Group. Phase 2 began with 4th Panzer Army advancing on Kharkov, with the SS Panzer Corps in parallel on its left. They reached the Mosh River, 10 miles to the south of the city, and on the 5th, SS Panzer Corps now broke away from the 4th Panzer Army and advanced on Kharkov. Hauser, the SS commander, sent one division into the city from the north and another from the west. It took three days of very heavy fighting before Kharkov fell. Operation Citadel, the last great German offensive in the east, was also the swan song of the Panzer III as a battle tank. In this battle, which turned on the ability of the mass German panzers to effect a rapid and decisive victory over the Red Army in and around the Kursk salient, the Panzer III played a major role. Of the 2,700 tanks and assault guns the Germans had assembled for the offensive, 432 were Panzer III's, mounting the long L60 50mm gun. There were also 88 that still employed the short-barreled 50mm cannon. Many of the Panzer III M's, delivered as replacements for earlier losses, now disported the same thin metal shirts and, or armoured skirts, to be seen on the Panzer IV G's and H's. The German offensive opened on July the 5th, and almost immediately the northern and southern pincers found themselves in trouble. Although aware that the Soviet defences were massive in scope, nothing had prepared the Germans to face the vast killing ground the Soviets had turned the salient into. It had been designed to bleed the Panzerwaffe white, which is precisely what it did. Gigantic minefields had been laid in the early spring, so that by high summer the wheat and maize disguised their existence. Other minefields were designed quite specifically to channel German armour into killing grounds in which pack fronts, groups of anti-tank guns pre-sighted on position, would open fire and destroy the Panzer. Hidden batteries of heavy artillery would open up, raining down ferocious barrages on the tanks and accompanying infantry. Little wonder that German tank losses rose rapidly. Losses of the Panzer III were high, not the least reason being that it was quite simply no longer adequate for the type of war being fought on the Eastern Front. The Soviets regard Kursk as perhaps the most decisive battle of the war in that it finally broke the German tank arm destroying such numbers of panzers that they could never be adequately replaced and, in doing so, blunting forever the German army's best sword.
With the phase-out of the Panzer III N at the end of August 1943, the Panzer III as a battle tank became a wasting asset in the German army inventory, although it is still to be seen in battles on the Eastern Front through to the end of 1943. The versatility of the design lent itself to employment in other roles. Many were converted to become Panzerbefehlswagen or medium tracked command vehicles, wherein they would carry inside the turret more communications equipment, so as to allow effective tactical command and control over groups of panzers. Others were employed as armoured observation posts for the artillery, and the chassis was utilised right through to war's end as the basis of the Sturmgeschutz III or assault gun. Panzer III's that survived the conflict were to be found in secondary theatres of war, as in this still which shows tank commanders surrendering their Mark III's to the Allies in Norway.